uh, we, we start gradually. Um, so for, first of all, uh, of course, uh, I want to explain a bit what the background is of uh, organizing this uh, series of, uh, of at least the colloquium on chemical reaction engineering. So the background is uh, that uh, our the American division, chemical reaction engineering, does this regularly. And I think it's, it's very successful in doing this. And it also uh, helps to, to build uh, uh, the community and to keep the community together. And uh, so in, in this respect, that uh, uh, we will try uh, also in Europe to, to establish something like this. And uh, we're very happy that we have as a first speaker, uh, Professor Paul Dauenhauer here. Um, just to, to inform you, we will record this session, but not the questioning. And um, if you have a question, put it in the chat and, and we will get back to you at uh, the end of the, the presentation. Uh, just to make sure that, that uh, uh, everything happens in an yeah, organized way. Uh, I would say try to mute yourself. Uh, if, uh, so Kevin de Ross is in charge of muting people that are uh, <laughs> pop in. Uh, and uh, he has the full uh, uh, authority to do that. So, Kevin, you know. Uh, um, but let me introduce the speaker. I don't know. He, I don't know if he needs a lot of introduction, but I will do it anyway. So, so Paul received his uh, bachelor degree at uh, uh, in chemical engineering and chemistry from the University of Wisconsin Madison in 2004, and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota in 2008 supervised by Professor Lenny Schmidt, that we all know. From 2008 to 2009, Paul worked as a senior research engineer for the Dow Chemical Company within the core R&D reaction engineering in Midland and the hydrocarbons and energy department in Freeport, Texas. In 2009, he joined the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts Amherst Department of Chemical Engineering as an assistant professor. As of 2014, he is the Lenny Sh and Charlotte Smith Professor at MacArthur Fellow at the University of Minnesota, in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Material Science. His work has been highlighted with the NSF Career Award, the DOE Early Career Award, the Kami Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, and the AICG CRE Young Investigator Award. His published patent applications serve as the scientific foundation of five startup companies Cyrenoc Renewables, Lucky Technologies, Activated Research Company. Carba Inc. and Enverde LLC. So with this uh, introduction, Paul, uh, I will give you the floor and uh, all the best. And I hope we can hear you and see you. So, but I see you sure. in, at least in the presentation. Is also, and we can hear you. Well, okay, so good. We're all set. Thanks. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to speak to many people that I haven't seen in, in two years plus in person. We, we have some new uh, research we've been working on the past three years, and within that we have some new research that I'll be presenting for the very first time I'm excited to show you. So the title here is, it contains a lot of words that maybe you haven't seen before, and so my goal in this presentation is to introduce you to a lot of these new concepts. But they all go back to this idea of how we think about reaction systems and catalytic systems. The idea ideology of catalysis has been for for, since its inception, the idea of structure function. We find the right structure for the best performance. And of course, I show other things because this metaphor works for other things. The bridge, we find the right bridge structure, it gives us the right function. And with the revolution in nanotechnology, this has given us the ability to make materials tailored precisely for specific applications and advanced reaction control to the level it's at right now. And for some applications, this has been revolutionary. So where this gets problematic and challenging are when we look at a lot of the applications that we're interested in for energy applications. One of the things we're interested in is taking wind and solar power and using that power to drive reactions to convert water, CO2, and air into hydrogen, ammonia, and methanol. Now, all three of these reactions are Sabatier limited. So if, if you're a student, you haven't heard of this concept before, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, concept, which is if we and look at the rate of reaction for these three reactions, plus many others, 
we can see that if we look for a description of that particular catalytic material, that's the x-axis, the independent axis here, we can actually plot the different catalytic materials such that we see an optimum in performance. And this goes for methanol synthesis. We've had the best catalyst for a very long time. We've, we're making incremental improvements, but we're close to that peak. Same thing with ammonia synthesis. And of course, oxygen evolution and oxygen reduction are key in fuel cell use and electrolysis. So how can we advance these technologies significantly if we're already at a catalytic speed limit that's maximized at the peak of these volcanoes? This is a very important point I'm gonna come back to in about 20 minutes. But the first question is why does this happen and what can we do about it? Of course, this is the classic picture we show in catalysis and catalytic reactions. We have a reactant, we have a product, and in, if this reaction was to proceed in the gas phase without any catalyst, it would have a very high activation energy. And the idea of a catalyst is we absorb it to a molecule to a surface and we lower that activation energy. So we go from the blue to the green. The problem being that when we look at a catalytic process, it's a series of steps and the introduction of a catalyst might lower the barrier for one step, but it might introduce a new barrier, such as the desorption barrier you see here in orange, that then slows the process down. So a better catalyst might be something like this right here, where now I've found a lower barrier for catalysis, a lower barrier for adsorption. And if I want to go faster, I have to think about what would the energy profile take to go from reactant to product. I can say, well, what if I could find a catalytic material that would actually have a surface reaction, which is exothermic? Now that would, by linear scaling relationships, reduce the transition state energy and lower the barrier for catalysis. But you see then that what it does is it increases the desorption barrier. And this is a very simple idea that there are trade-offs in how catalysts operate. At some point, every improvement we make in one elementary step is a detriment to another. And we actually achieve this kind of trade-off between the two at the peak of this Sabatier volcano. And so what can we do about this? What we would like to do is say that, well, it's possible we're never going to find a material that exists above these Sabatier limits, just based on the principle that we're always going to have different elementary steps that have to be balanced for any static material. So what we could do is take the amazing structure function performance we've got with advanced materials and build in a new capability on top of that. And so an expanded catalysis ideology would be something like find the right structure and perturb it effectively for the best performance. So we add on from structure function to structure function perturbation. And what I'm gonna show you here is a device we just actually uh, announced last week. Uh, we put it in a preprint, it's now under peer review. Uh, for publication, but I'm gonna present it to you here. This is one of the ways we can perturb a catalytic reaction. So what you're looking at here is a cartoon diagram of what I'm gonna show you. You have a layer of alumina in purple, which is the solid acid site. And this is on a layer of graphene, which can conduct charge across the device. You have an insulating layer of hafnium oxide, which doesn't allow charge to move through it. And on the bottom here, you have your support, which is a conductive silicon layer. And the idea is very simple. If I want to control a catalyst, uh, chemistry is all about electrons. We can actually add holes or add electrons to that catalytic layer and perturb the performance of that material with time. So how much charge can we put into the active site, positive or negative, and how much does that affect the chemistry? And I'm going to look at a very simple chemistry just because we want to, we're going to have a complex catalyst. Let's have a very simple chemistry. In this case, it's isopropanol, which can dehydrate to make propene or do a couple other small reactions, which in this system are not uh, important. So here's the device. You can see down here, this is an American quarter. It's not that big. Uh, this is the device right here. And you can see there's a gold contact on the top where we can actually uh, apply a, a potential bias to the material. You can see the, the P-type silicon on the bottom, the hafnium oxide a layer of graphene, and on top of that, an amorphous layer of alumina, the solid acid catalyst. And if we look, uh, take a slice of this material from top to bottom, you can see over here on the right, the graphene layer, the amorphous alumina, and down here, you can actually see the where the alumina sits on top of the hafnium oxide and a thin layer of graphene, it's single and multi-layer, depending on where you look in the material. Now, what can we do with this? If we wanna put charge into that surface, and manipulate the catalytic properties of that surface, we have to ask, well, how much charge are we putting in? And one way we can do that is through CV curves. 
So what we do is we apply a voltage to that device and we measure the charge uptake. Now I'm showing this here. This is the amount of charge that's been put into that material in the number of electrons per square centimeter. And I'm doing this for the device that contains alumina on graphene and another device that's just graphene without the alumina. And what you see is we get almost an order of magnitude more charge when we have the alumina layer, which, which makes, allows us to infer that the charge is actually going into the alumina itself. And that's important because the alumina is where the chemistry happens. Now, the question is, that sounds like a lot of charge, but is it a lot of charge? So if I look over here on this bar chart, chart the red and the blue are the same data I've shown you on the left at three volts. I can get the same charge if I put a gold layer on top, which tells me I'm, I'm maximizing the performance of this device. And then I can ask, how much charge do I have relative to how many sites I would have with alumina? And what you can see here, this is a log scale. I'm within about an order of magnitude uh, away, a factor of 10 off from the total number of sites, which means I'm manipulating somewhere around 10% of an electron per active site. Now, what I want to do with this is think about how I can manipulate the chemistry. So if I take isopropanol and I dehydrate it, I will make propene. And so if I do a temperature programmed surface reaction, what I do is I take my catalyst, I put isopropanol on the surface, and then I slowly ramp the temperature up from room temperature up to a higher temperature. And at some temperature, I have enough thermal energy for the reaction to proceed. And depending on the catalyst that I'm working with, this peak temperature of propene formation shifts depending on the acidity. So tungsten oxide and alumina are more acidic than titania and zirconia, and their peak temperatures are lower and higher uh, correspondingly. So I can think about how different materials perform, but I can then ask in parallel, if I make take this device here, which we call a catalytic condenser, I can look at the effect of the alumina without any bias, but I can also think of it as a continuum. If I have the ability to put in and take out electrons, put in holes or put in electrons, I can think about sliding the alumina up and down this scale and taking a single material and making it behave like many other materials. So here's some actual data that shows what I was just talking about. This is again, the, this is our alumina graphene catalytic condenser device. So everything you're seeing here is a reaction on the alumina, but under different amounts of bias that we're applying. So we're actually applying positive bias. So we're taking out electrons and we're making the alumina more acidic. So you can see down here with zero bias, zero volt potential, we get a propene peak right where we would expect it to be for alumina. And then as we pull out more and more electrons, we shift this propene peak to lower and lower temperature. We're making it more acidic and we're allowing the reaction to happen at lower temperatures. And you can actually see that this corresponds to the activation energy to form propene. Up here, we have our barrier at about 115 kilojoules per mole, and we drop it down to about 100 kilojoules per mole as we add three um, positive volts to the catalytic layer. Now, this, of course, raises the question of what, where does the charge go? How does it affect the chemistry? And my collaborator and colleague, Matt Newrock at the University of Minnesota was looking at this exact issue in parallel with us uh, via DFT. And so he said, well, let's look at the active site for, for alumina and let's calculate the binding energy of the molecule isopropanol under neutral and positive bias. And it's a little difficult to see here, but you can see actually see that the, the bond length between the the aluminum and the oxygen shortens as you take out electrons. So you're actually strengthening that bond. You're binding alumina stronger or isopropanol stronger to the alumina surface. And you can actually see that over here as well as in this is the actual data from that calculation. As I take isopropanol from neutral to positive uh, bias on, the, on an alumina surface, I'm significantly increasing the binding energy. And at the same time, on the vertical axis here, you're seeing the activation energy. So I'm decreasing the energy required for the reaction to proceed. Now, if I compare what I have experimentally with computation, it looks like we're taking out somewhere around 8 to 10 percent of an electron, which is what approximately what we see by computation as well. Now, let me summarize this because this is important for where I'm going and more the reaction engineering side of this presentation. This is, again, is the normalized propene formation rate. And it's for three different powder materials, alumina, titanium, and zirconia. And in purple here now is the alumina material where I've applied a bias. 
So what we're essentially doing is making the aluminum material behave like an entirely new material. But even more important, that's great because now I can tune the material to the, to the characteristics that I want. But because I'm only moving electrons around, I'm not moving uh, atoms, I can do this very quickly. In fact, I can switch this between these two states a thousand times per second. And I think it's, uh, well, we know for sure we can go significantly faster with a dis different design for the device. So this opens up a new way of thinking about how I can actually do controllable catalytic chemistry. And let me tell you what I, what I mean by this. If we have the ability to actually manipulate a, tr a catalyst electronically and change it a thousand times per second, make it behave like different materials in time, I can actually think about programming that catalyst. I can send it different electronic signals and make it behave like a different material at different points in time. And because it's this fast, a thousand times per second, I can change it at the speed or faster than the catalytic turnover. And so then I have to start thinking about, well, what program or what voltage program would I actually want to send to a catalyst to make it behave the way that I want? And this is why this is a, a topic of catalytic reaction engineering. The question of engineering a program that I would send to a catalyst to ex accelerate the chemistry and control it for selectivity, rate, and conversion. Let me give you an idea of what I mean now. So if I think of the catalyst over here on the right, on my catalytic condenser, I can apply a voltage VCAT you see right here. And as I change that, I'm going to put in charge and take out charge from the catalytic surface. And so one very simple program I could give it would be a sinusoidal waveform you see over here on the left. So the voltage is positive, and then it goes to neutral, and then it's positive, and then it goes to neutral. Now, I can imagine a very simple scenario where that would be very beneficial. For example, if I have the generic reaction A goes to B, you can see that A actually adsorbs, and then under a very strong uh, positive bias, I'm going to bind A very strongly, lower the barrier, and that's when it reacts through this transition state to B. And then as I put electrons back in and put it into a neutral form, B can desorb and the reaction turns over. So this is a very simplistic interpretation of what you could program. As this gets more complicated, the programs will presumably have to get a lot more complicated. So this is something we've actually been thinking about for several years. If I go back to where we started with this presentation, we of course have this limitation that goes across all of these really important energy reactions. So this is the same volcano concept that I talked about earlier. So the vertical axis here is the reaction rate, the turnover frequency. The independent axis is a description of the catalytic material. Except now we can imagine, rather than having many different materials, we could have one catalyst and we could electronically change that catalyst with time. Now, if we do that, one question is, if, if I think about the red point here is what I've been able to achieve with a static material, what could I achieve with a material that actually changes with time? And what I want to show you is that if we think of this amplitude left to right here as how much I'm changing the catalyst electronically with time, I can actually exist up above this on this, we, we call this this resonant tie line right here in purple. And of course, on a log scale, that's orders of magnitude faster than the static optimum you see there in the red. So what am I actually doing when I change the, the electronic state of the catalyst? Well, what I'm doing is, of course, I'm changing the energy of the intermediates that are absorbed on the surface and the transition state energies. So if I was to take a catalyst and switch it only between two states, state one and state two, and if I go back to the catalytic condenser, that would be one voltage and then switching to another voltage back and forth very quickly. I could imagine picking one state, apply a voltage that gives me a lower transition state energy, and then flipping to another state that gives me very fast desorption of B back into the gas phase. This is actually the idea I was explaining earlier with the cartoon. So the question is, how much can I change these two states to give me the lowest transition state energy in blue in state one and the fastest desorption in state B? So this all fits into, if I think about reaction systems, where does uh, dynamics occur and what type of dynamics there are? Of course, dynamics are not new to anybody that knows the history of uh, reaction engineering and catalytic reaction engineering, but the question is, where does this fit into the history of reaction dynamics? And of course, we can take all of dynamic reacting systems and put them into whether they're forced or passive. Some systems in the passively respond with time by deactivation or restructuring or reactor instabilities. 
But I'm talking about forced changes here, where I will forcibly change the voltage and push reactions into different conditions. This is, of course, different also than reactor dynamics. There's, there's more than half a century of really interesting research on variations in temperature, pressure, composition. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're actually talking about this first box where we're going to change the catalyst with time, and everything in the gas phase would actually be uh, uh, fixed. <clears throat> All right, so how am I going to explore this and be more quantitative about these ideas? So what I'm going to do is a very simple reactor uh, simulation here, where I'm going to feed in generic component A, and that can react to form B. A to B can happen on the surface, forwards and backwards. A can adsorb and desorb, and B can adsorb and desorb. So I have all of my normal reactor parameters, space velocity, temperature, pressure. I have my catalytic chemistry that happens on the surface, my overall thermodynamics, heats of adsorption, but now I have a whole bunch of new parameters that arise because of the dynamics of the catalyst itself. The amplitude will be how much I'm changing the, the, the catalyst with time. The amplitude position will be where I start and stop in my applied voltage. The frequency will be how fast I'm switching back and forth. And the waveform type will be square waves, sinusoidal waves, et cetera, or combinations thereof. So here's one simulation just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like. So up on the top here, this is my relative binding energy of B. This is the, essentially the program I'm putting in. This is a very simple one. This is a square wave, and you can see I go from very strong binding to weak binding, and it's relative, that's why we pass through zero. But what you can see is that as I go from strong binding to weak binding, strong binding to weak binding, if I go down to this data set on the bottom, the surface coverage of the molecules on the surface change dramatically with time. In fact, if I look, if I only have molecules A and B and the opportunity for an open site, I'm actually switching completely between uh, full coverage in species A and full coverage in species B. So I'm filling the surface with A, filling it with B, filling it with A, and filling it with B. And then if I look at the data in the middle, every time I switch from B to A in surface coverage, all of that product B comes off the surface very quickly and my instantaneous turnover frequency gets really high very quickly. And then as I deplete the surface, it comes back down and needs to be refilled. Which raises the question, even for these simple systems, how fast should I be switching my surface? And I can ask that very simply uh, with this data because I can look at the instantaneous turnover frequency for four different frequencies and just compare them. So what you're looking at here is the rate of reaction uh, for A goes to B at 0 0.001 hertz very slowly, all the way up to 1,000 hertz. And in red here, this is actually the point of the, the, the volcano peak that before I wasn't able to surpass. So at very low frequencies, the system behaves like two catalysts, one catalyst down here and one catalyst up there. There's a short transient to switch between the two, but other than that, the catalyst very quickly comes to a steady state. It's not until I get to about 0.25 hertz that the dynamics of the system achieve the maximum of the static case. So the red here matches the best I could do statically. And the frequencies above that at 10 hertz or 1,000 hertz go dramatically above that Sabatier peak. So I can actually look at all of these frequencies rather than just four. Let's look at a whole continuum of frequencies. And what you're looking at here now, this is the average turnover frequency. So I take the the instantaneous with time and average it out. And I look at that as a function of the frequency that I apply to the surface. So if you're still thinking of this as this catalytic condenser device, it's how fast I'm switching the voltage on that. And what you can see here in red, this is again the static optimum, the volcano peak. And once I get to about 0.1 hertz, uh, I'm actually surpassing that and going all the way up here to somewhere between 10 and 100 hertz, maybe around 30 hertz for this system. And then I actually max out the total rate that I can get. And that's because if I was to go back and look at this volcano plot, these are the natural frequencies associated with the rate limiting steps of that reaction. And so that gives me this range where I've taken the natural frequencies of the chemistry and matched them up to the frequency that I apply for this particular catalytic device. And this holds for several orders of magnitude until the point where I'm trying to switch the device much too fast for the chemistry to keep up and my response in chemistry actually decreases at that point. So there's a, a, a fairly wide band of frequencies for which I can achieve this maximum output. Now, of course, this is fixed depending on other parameters that I pick. So if I look at this, I was just looking at a waveform amplitude of 0.6 electron volts 
and species B. So as I was flipping the voltage or, or changing the, the catalyst with time, component B on the surface was changing by about 60 kilojoules per mole. And if I follow that line vertically up through this data set, I can actually see the, the exact same plateau and resonant conditions here in orange that I was looking at on the previous slide. But what you see also is if I looked at different amplitudes, also at different frequencies, you can see that as I get to larger and larger amplitudes, I'm getting significantly higher rates, up to the point where I would hit diffusion limits for these particular systems. Okay, well then the, the next question becomes, I can go faster by oscillating my catalyst with time, but is this a, an enormous waste of energy? And you have to ask the question, well, how much energy does it take to flip the surface from one state to another? The other component of that, though, is every time I flip the catalyst from one state to another, do I get a reaction? And so there's a very simple way to, to quantify this as the turnover efficiency. In other, in other words, I want to relate what is the turnover frequency I'm getting from dynamics relative to the frequency at which I'm flipping the surface. And I have to, of course, take off the average steady state of turnover frequency uh, subtracted from that dynamic rate enhancement. And what you can see, though, is that if this band here ranges from 0 to 100%, there's a range of conditions where I get almost perfect efficiency in my catalytic device. In other words, every time I flip the catalyst from one state to another, I get a complete turnover in the catalytic reaction. And that's, of course, the most efficient way to operate your catalyst. Now, this, of course, gets much more complicated because I've only been talking about generic A to B systems. But real chemistries of interest that display the Sabatier behavior have multiple elementary steps. And on top of that, they have multiple sites. And those sites can change with time. They can change in surface coverage. Here's an example of a paper uh, Dion Velakos and I wrote that just came out in Science Advances, where we were looking at hydrogen and nitrogen reacting to make ammonia. And this could go through both terrace and step sites. And of course, the question becomes, well, before I was looking at one elementary reaction, what happens when I have all of these elementary reactions all being perturbed dynamically with time, and they all have their unique response to perturbation. How can I think about that? And so what I want to do is I want to kind of globalize elementary reactions and say, these are the different classes of responses that I can get to perturbations, and how can they then think about putting them all together? So I have to go back to kind of look at general reaction description which is if I have a catalytic reaction of A on the surface going to B on the surface, <clears throat> I can think about the relationships in their energy to the transition state by this linear scaling relationship. And this has, of course, been well known for, for decades that these relationships exist linearly and that I can relate the activation energy to the surface heat of reaction by this alpha and beta parameter. And so if I was to vary alpha, this, this, this slope scaling parameter here, you can actually see that as I change that alpha parameter from red up to, to purple, from one to zero, I change the shape of the volcano plot that I'm working with for that elementary reacting system. Now that matters a lot because the shape of the volcano determines the natural frequencies of that particular chemistry. So here's an example of two uh, volcano plots with different scaling relationships. So on the left here in red, this is an alpha of one, it's a much steeper volcano, and you can see that these are, of course, incredibly high uh, perturbations, but that's I want to do this just to accentuate the effect. So at 1.5 electron volts shift in binding energy, I'm getting up almost to the megahertz turnover frequencies. And that's because this volcano is so sharp that the natural frequencies of the, the system, the reaction, increase dramatically as I change the relative binding energy of species. So that's a high alpha. If I go to the green, this is a moderate alpha. And what you see now is that my volcano becomes much shallower. And if I increase the perturbation level up to 1.5, I can't push these up to higher frequencies because the natural frequencies of the reaction chemistry are much lower. So I'm interested in particular in very narrow volcanoes in general because they give me the highest natural frequencies that I can achieve. But what else is there? If I think of a single elementary step, I can think of A star going to B star. I can parameterize this as the transition state energy here. So this alpha and beta define the transition state energy. But I also care about the relative perturbations of surface reactant and surface products. So I have my alpha and beta for the transition state, and I have my gamma and delta 
for the different the relationship between surface products and surface reactants. So between these two, I care about these four parameters plus the heat of reaction for a single elementary step. Now, of course, the, the gamma here is the slope between these two, and the delta point is important. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. The delta point is the point where the two surface species in purple here have the exact same energy. And if I go above that, you can see that state B is, is uh, higher in energy than A. And if I go below that, state B is lower in energy than, than molecule A. So I can actually take each elementary reaction and put this on this parameter map. So here's the heat of adsorption of A on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis is the heat of adsorption of component B. And you can see here, this is this delta point in purple where the two have the exact same energy. And the slope relates how much the two intermediates on the surface uh, change relative to one another. And in this case, it's a higher than, it's greater than one. So you can see actually that B is changing more than A in energy. All right, now, do molecules on surfaces behave this way under perturbation? And the answer from what we, we many other people, not, not myself, have already looked at this and, and shown this. So on the left, you can see work by Jean Sabine McEwen and coworkers where they were looking at electric fields and saying, what's the effect of electric fields on methane versus methanol, hydrogen versus methanol? You can see this linear relationship and you can see that they actually scale, they have relatively small gamma values. And even some systems have negative scaling relationships where one molecule weakens while the other strengthens. Uh, Manos Mavrakakis at the University of Wisconsin looked at this in terms of strain, and you can see for different metals, he gets different scaling relationships uh, for oxygen versus carbon monoxide, as an example. So of course, the way I perturb things matters a lot. The system I pick and the material I pick all matter in this combination of dynamic reacting systems. What else matters? Of course, the gamma parameter that I picked also changes the volcano. So what you're looking at here are the volcano plots. So this is the turnover frequency in the vertical axis. And on the bottom here is my descriptor used, in this case, it's the binding energy of B. And as I change my gamma parameter from less than one to greater than one and to equal to one, the shape of my volcano changes. And if I go forward, you can actually see that if I look at all the possible volcanoes, it sweeps out this entire supervolcano of possible uh, systems I look at. And it turns out what I don't want is to be have a gamma of one. I don't want to be close to this black uh, kind of flat volcano at the top, because what that means is as I'm changing and perturbing my catalyst, my two surface intermediates change together at the exact same energy, which means I'm not changing my transition state. So I'm interested in gamma parameters that are far from one in general. All right, so let me just summarize as we've gone so far. So we have a device here in the middle, and in that device, I can take a, a catalyst and I can do thermocatalysis with time, and I can change that with time. So we're not doing electrochemistry here, we're doing thermocatalysis and we're changing the catalyst with time. We've asked the question, what can I actually uh, use as a program to perturb that? And we've been looking just at simple perturbations here like sinusoidal and square waves. And of course, I raised the question of, do we want more complicated uh, uh, perturbations like you see down here below or even more complicated than that? That's still an open question. But of course, the benefits for this I've been talking about have been a rate because I'm interested in accelerating methanol synthesis, ammonia synthesis, uh, electrolysis to hydrogen and reactions of that sort. But there's other things we can do if we can control the catalytic reaction with time. And we can control, for example, competing pathways and control product selectivity but we can even do something else, which is very surprising, which is we can control the conversion of the reaction. This is a very strange thing to think about for catalytic reaction engineering. And what do I mean by this? Of course, I, I suspect everyone on this uh, presentation call knows that there are lots of important reactions that are equilibri equilibrium uh, limited. So here's my equilibrium conversion in the vertical axis and the reaction temperature down here on the bottom. And I'm just showing three important reactions, but of course there's hundreds where this is a, an issue for reaction engineering, such as ammonia synthesis, where it's favorable at low temperature, but the chemistry kinetics are faster, of course, at higher temperature where we can get reasonable rates. Same thing for water gas shift, where we have staged reactor systems for different temperatures and driver forming. <clears throat> now, how have we dealt with this historically in reaction engineering? Well, we look at the system and we try to pick condition, reaction conditions, temperature and pressure, 
that change the over delta, overall delta G of reaction to push the reaction to higher conversion. So for example, for ammonia chemistry, we compress it to high pressures. And of course that has an enormous impact on the scale of process that we have to have, the cost of operation and the capital equipment. Now what I, <clears throat> what I would prefer to do instead, if I could, is let the reaction proceed at a condition that's cheap to operate, low pressure and low temperature, and without changing the overall delta G of reaction, because I'm not changing the overall conditions, temperature and pressure, let's put work into the system through the surface and push a reaction away from equilibrium. I'm not changing the equilibrium, I'm pushing the reaction to a new steady state. And of course, I'm, I'm seeding this idea with you because this is what I'm gonna show you on the next slide, that the ability to manipulate a catalyst surface with time lets us do this and push reactions away from equilibrium. So what you're looking at here now is a simulation where I've taken a batch reactor. I'm gonna have a very simple reaction again, A goes to B, and I can start that batch reactor at any condition I want. I can put in 100% B, I can put in 50% A and B, or I can put in 0%, 100% A. No matter, no matter what I start my batch reactor at, and I operate this system dynamically. So I'm taking the surface, I'm switching it between two different states. You can see down here, it's a it's a, actually a relatively small perturbation at a thousand hertz. No matter where I start, I go to a steady state here that's offset from equilibrium by about 30% selectivity to product B. And of course, as soon as I turn the dynamics off, the reaction very quickly goes back to my equilibrium, which it has to, according to the laws of thermodynamics. And if I turn the dynamics back on, it goes right back to that steady state that I was looking at earlier. So the implication here is that we can drive reactions to new endpoints that are different than equilibrium. Now this, this might sound controversial because we always tell uh, students that reactions always go to equilibrium and catalysts do not change equilibrium. And of course they don't change equilibrium, but they can allow for, if they change with time, the ability to put work into a system. This is of course known in other fields as ratchet mechanisms. So if you're, if you're not familiar with this concept, the book I recommend you is Life's Ratchet by, by Peter Hoffman. It gives a very good introduction and establishes this idea that are known throughout biology that we, uh, and of course biology, humans are not at equilibrium and that's because we have internal ratchets that let us push chemical systems away from equilibrium. But what's happening is I can imagine it pictorially here is that as the reaction proceeds, reactant in green goes to yellow, and then as yellow weakens in binding energy, it allowed to desorb, but it's, it's faster to go forward than backwards because the transition state energy is here is high. So we're actually biasing the reaction in a forward direction and pushing it there by changing the heat of adsorption, by allowing us to put work into that particular system. Now, the question of course is, how do I know if I'm pushing a reaction forward or pushing it backwards? Because of course I care about that. Uh, I wanna push a reaction to high conversion in the direction of interest. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at a very simple simulation here. Here's the, the chemistry of interest that, I, that I'm after. It has a, this nice volcano shape again. I'm gonna take a perturbation and I'm gonna slide it from left to right. So I can have the same uh, amplitude of perturbation but I'm gonna have different starting points. So here's point one, two, three, four. So I'm moving it side to side at the same amplitude. And I'm gonna ask the question, am I perturbing a reaction forwards or backwards uh, away from equilibrium relative to the perspective of what I call reactant and product? So what you're looking at here is as I move this perturbation and slide it left to right, you can see here, this is the steady state conversion that I'm going to. So blue means uh, low conversion, all A, Red means high conversion, all B, and green means equilibrium. This is a system that, that at equilibrium would go to 50-50. And you can see here that the frequency of course matters. At very low frequencies, the system just goes to equilibrium. But as I start to get into about 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two Hertz, the system starts to favor and bias the system away from equilibrium to uh, significantly forward or significantly backwards reactions. And there's a very clear dividing line between forwards and backwards. That dividing line actually is visually very clear why it happens. A forward reaction over here on the right is gonna slip between two states. So an energy diagram in uh, strong binding would be in blue and weak binding would be in red. So it's gonna flip between blue, red, blue, red continuously. And what you see is in the what we call the forward direction on the strong binding condition, 
the green molecules here are stronger binding than the yellow. When I go to the other side and I push reactions backwards, the yellow molecules are stronger binding than the green. So where does this transition happen? It happens where the blue and the green molecules in the strongest binding condition are equal in energy. And that's what we call, if you remember earlier, the delta point. So if I back up this transition right here, this is the delta point of that particular chemistry. Well, this gets more complicated as I look at uh, other types of more exotic systems. This now is a catalytic system where the perturbation gives me negative scaling. In other words, as the, the purple molecules weaken in binding energy, the pink molecules actually weaken and they move in opposite directions. This is a very interesting energy profile because biology really, really likes this uh, type of ratchet mechanism. And it turns out here this directionality descriptor is a little more complicated because of that. And it's actually taken uh, uh, graduate student Sally Gathman uh, a while to, to figure this out of how we think about this. But you can see that actually this direction, directionality descriptor is a ratio of time scales under each of its binding conditions. If you want more information here, this, this is a, a relatively complicated system, so I just want to highlight it. All right, let me leave you with kind of one last uh, thing that we care about. Of course, we've talked about rate enhancement with dynamic catalyst uh, uh, conversion control, but we can also think about selectivity control. If I have reactant A and I want to make product B and I want to minimize product C, of course, we have to find ways to promote one pathway over the other. And so here what I've done is just a, a proof of concept that we can look at these very simple systems and say, how do we have the ability to, per, to actually direct molecules down one pathway over another and control selectivity? So here are two different reactions. You can see here on this parameter map, the green versus the purple have different parameters because they're different chemistries as we would expect. And I wanna ask the question, can I control when I make product B or when I make product C? And the answer, of course, is let's look first at the rate of reaction. So this is the turnover frequency uh, of the system under static conditions. And of course, this descriptor down here would be different materials. And what you see is for the parameters we've picked, there's regions where it's very easy to make product C because it happens very quickly. And there's a region down here now where making product B uh, actually matches the rate of formation of product C. So the best I could ever do with to make product B would be a 50% selectivity. But what's possible with a dynamic perturbation, actually you can see that under static conditions at very slow frequencies down here on the bottom. This is the oscillation frequency in the vertical axis. At very low oscillation frequencies, that's exactly what I see. Formation of product C in blue, and then a 50-50 mixture here in green of B and C products. Now, as I increase the frequency, what you'll see is there's a region here in red where I'm dramatically accelerating the rate of product B so much so that I'm almost perfectly making B and shutting down the, the formation of product C. And this region right here in red corresponds to oscillating to either side of this red volcano. So I'm accelerating, I'm hitting the natural frequencies of this reaction of A to B and then accelerating it far beyond the reaction to make C and pushing that reaction forward. Okay, so I've, I've gone over a lot of things, but I want to kind of summarize here at the very end, which is that what I like about this approach is historically we've looked at structure function relationships and tried to find the right material. But if we think about this as structure function perturbation, it actually becomes a strategy. How can I take a catalytic material and combine chemistry, perturbation, and material to build, optimize, and test for the chemistry that I want? And of course, I've shown you conceptually that we can... Um, get significant rate enhancement and control of products. And now I can show you experimentally <clears throat> with this catalytic condenser device that these types of materials are actually possible. What excites me about this so much is that it gives us a, a level of control for catalytic reaction engineering that we've not had in the past that can apply to our most important targets for climate change applications, hydrogen production, methanol synthesis, ammonia synthesis, but a host of other systems where selectivity remains a problem, such as selective oxidation reactions. But of course, you know, this is a very new topic. Immense work remains to extend to these capabilities to more complex reacting systems and to understand their behavior. So let me just conclude here by, by acknowledging some of the people who did this work. Alex Arda wrote the first papers on dynamic simulations. Manish Shetty, who's now a professor at Texas A&M, uh, continued looking at perturbations. And uh, Xia Mingang, who uh, actually uh, developed and invented this catalytic condenser device I showed you at the beginning. 
uh, Professor Omar Abdurrahman, Sally Gathman, Judy Thurman, and then Professors Dan Frisbee, Andre McCoy, and Matt Newrock all contributed to parts of this research and was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, and a, a generous donation from the Steva family here in Minnesota. So thank you for your time, uh, and hopefully uh, I can answer any questions that you have. <laughs>